Hi everyone, um, welcome to our talk today with Skylar Baylor. My name is Eli, my pronouns are he, him, and they, them. I'm super excited to welcome Skylar. Skylar Baylor is the first transgender athlete to compete on any sport in an NCAA Division I men's team. By 15, he was one of the nation's top 20 15-year-old breaststrokers. By 17, he set a national age group record. In college, he swam for Harvard University on Harvard's winningest team in 50 years. Skylar's difficult choice, to transition while potentially giving up the prospect of being an NCAA champion was historic. His story has appeared everywhere from 60 Minutes to the Washington Post. Skyler's tireless advocacy has earned him numerous honors, including LGBTQ Nation's Instagram advocate for 2020. In 2021, Skyler also released his first middle grade novel, Obi is Man Enough. Skyler Baylor, welcome to Toxic Google. I am so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I just gave a super quick, uh, super quick introduction to you. Um, but for those who aren't as familiar with your story and your work and your work, could you tell us a little bit about your journey as a swimmer, a trans man, um, and an advocate? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, hi everybody. I'm Skylar. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm 25 years old. I am a swimmer. Like Eli said, I've been swimming my whole life. Really. I actually learned how to swim around the same time. I learned how to walk at 10 months old. So I always joke that uh, I'm not much of a land animal and I trip and fall over myself often, which is true. Um, I got good at swimming around the age of nine, 10. Um, not, not like great, but okay. Then I got really good around 13, 14, was recruited to swim in college at, at, um, at 17, uh, co committed to swim at Harvard University. At the time, I was really struggling with my mental health, actually. And so I actually took a gap year between high school and college, uh, went to a treatment center for the eating disorder that I was struggling with. Um, that's where I figured out that I am transgender. And then I thought I was going to lose everything that I loved because, um, as you all know, gender is really important in sports. Uh, and, I, and I didn't know what to do about swimming, you know. Um, fast forward several years, uh, at, 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 you know, down the line, I, I became the first transgender swimmer to compete for a Division One men's team in college. Um, and I have just not stopped talking about it. Uh, and so that's kind of what brings me here is, is really to share that possibility with you all. Thanks so much for being here and, and thank you so much for you know speaking so openly about your story. Maybe it's kind of a given at this point in your life that this is this is kind of um it, something that, that struck me, I guess, is I don't know how much you really chose this to become this kind of activist and this visible face of trans athletics. It kind of seems like maybe you didn't have as much of a choice. Um tell me a little bit about kind of choosing to continue to stay in the public eye and continuing to be an advocate and and tell your story so so publicly. Sure. I appreciate you providing that sort of space for my own agency. Um, so I, I did take some choice uh, in deciding to be open about my journey and that right before I, I committed to swim for the men's team, because um, it was a, that was a, a choice as well. I chose to swim for the men's team instead of the women's team. My coaches said, listen, Skylar, if you don't want to talk about this, if you don't want to tell everybody, if you don't want to give the interviews, that's okay. Harvard has a really tight PR system. We can protect you and you don't have to tell everybody about it. Um, and I said, absolutely not. If I do this, if I compete for the men's team, I will tell people and I will share about my story. Um, I was like, I'm not going to scream it from the rooftops, but I, but I, but I'm going to tell people. Of course, I actually kind of do end up. <laughs> I did end up screaming it from the rooftops in one way or another, the virtual ones. Um, but um, but I, I I made a very conscious decision to say yes, I will accept the interviews. Yes, I will tell people about this journey. Um, and it was really for one reason, one reason only. It's because I wanted people to know that this is possible. I wanted younger trans people to look at me and say, hey, this is this, I can do this. I can be me as well. Um, when I was coming out, and uh, and I think a lot of trans people have similar experiences, but when I was coming out, I was Googling all the time, transgender swimmer, transgender athlete, transgender, you know, trying to look for people like me and nothing came up, right? It was empty search returns. Um, now, if you if you Google uh, transgender swimmer, you Google transgender athlete, I pop up. And now other people start to do so as well. Um, it's not about my face popping up. It's about somebody popping up because it tells that kid in the middle of nowhere in Arkansas or wherever they are that they can belong to because that's really what they're asking. Can I belong? And I want my face, my story to be a resounding yes. I, I love that so much. And I know you said that you do this kind of for young people to have someone to look up to, but 
I mean, I'm, I'm older than you are. I, I came out after you didn't, and you're very much someone that I looked up to um, in my own journey. So you're impacting people of, of all ages and especially athletes, because you're right, we really do kind of lack that, that representation. And it's so meaningful just to um, be able to see yourself in some way. So, um, you know, it's, it's Trans Awareness Week. Um, you've done an enormous amount to, to raise awareness and, and I really appreciate that. Thank you so um, much, I appreciate that too. And maybe, maybe that's a great way to kind of lead into talking about your book. Um, you published your first book this year, Obi is Man Enough. Yeah, I have, I, I couldn't get a copy in Switzerland. I do have it up on my Kindle though, so. That works. Yes, um, <laughs> uh, but you know, I was, I was personally very affected by this book. I don't know what it would have meant to me to have read something like that as a young person. So really a huge heartfelt thank you for putting this out um, into the world and, and huge congrats on, on all the success um, that the book is, is having. Um, and yeah, that's, this, this issue is, is really something that, that Obi is actually struggles with. He, he kind of has this visibility forced upon him and, and there's these kind of moments where he really wants to disappear, but it's, it's not really an option. Um, how, how did you think about kind of infusing your own experience into that character and into the choices that, that he takes? Yeah. Well, so Obi is absolutely a fictional character. Um, he's a Korean American transgender swimmer who's 13. And while I'm also a Korean American transgender swimmer, I'm A, not 13, and B, uh, Obi is not me. And I just like to make that clear. However, a lot of Obi's experiences are drawn from my life and, and at least imaginations of my life, if that makes sense. I kind of thought of the book as, as an ode to the boyhood that I never quite had. Um, Obi comes out when he's nine and 10 uh, and is able to transition um, actually before he begins puberty. Uh, and so there's a, there's a, a totally different, you know, life stage, if you will, that he goes through because of that. Um, Obi, Obi wants to disappear in certain moments because he doesn't know how to show up as himself, um, and he isn't given always the space to. And and the book um, shifts into a place uh, that I, I hope I can show how Obi can be himself, and he learns more and more to take up space um, and to live authentically as much as possible, and live courageously also through all of the transphobia that he does experience. Um, and I, I tried to show um, both, right? I didn't want him to just have this glorious life that was easy. I mean, I, I did want him to have a glorious, easy life, but that's not realistic right now. Um, and so I wanted to both show the the sort of positives where he, he learns to grow through the things that are difficult for him, but also that those things are difficult at some point because that's what trans people experience right now uh, in many places around the world. And, and I want it to be realistic. Yeah, I think something you did really well is weave together these two audiences, which is perhaps kids who maybe are trans or think gender questioning in some way, and maybe this book is representation for them, but also adults, people who might know not know what does transphobia look like, how can I support a trans person? How did how did you manage to write a book that actually speaks to kind of everyone in that way? I imagine this was a huge challenge. Yeah, it absolutely was a tra challenge. And I, I, I'm really glad that you think that I did it well. So thank you for that, Eli. Um, I, in the entire time, people people asked me since, I, since the book was released, who did you write the book for, right? Who did you write the book for? What's the audience? And my answer is always twofold. I write it for trans kids who didn't get to see themselves and who don't get to see themselves and for cis people who don't see trans people, right? Or who don't, you know, don't know about trans people. Um, and those are two really different audiences. <laughs> um, one, I'm trying to hand their stories back to them. And one, I'm trying to hand somebody a story that, A, maybe they don't want or that they've never seen. Um, and my, I don't really know exactly how I balance. I just tried to think of that in every moment that, that came up in the book. I thought, okay, how would a trans kid receive this? And how would somebody who's never met a trans person receive this? Um, maybe even a transphobic person, how would they receive this? So I tried to just really go over each moment with that, with that in mind. Um, I am sure that there are moments in the book that tend to, sort of to be more digestible to one audience or the other. Um, and I think it made uh, parts of the book really difficult even to include at all. Um, so as, as you know, um, but hopefully without getting too many spoilers, there's quite a bit of transphobia in the book that Obi experiences. Um, and, and also a couple moments of violence. Um, and I, really struggled on whether or not to include those because uh, you know for young trans people who might have or any trans people really who might have experienced similar transphobia or similar acts of violence it could be really difficult to read those it could be really painful to read those um, almost re-traumatization or um, you know just painful and scary to read those um, and I and I thought should I just not include it because of that because I don't want to hurt anybody 
And I thought about the fact that a lot of people who read this are going to be cis, right? And I want those cis people to read these moments of transphobia and they want them to root for Obi. I want them to read that and say, well, that should never happen. Because as the as you read the book, as I've designed it, hopefully you root for Obi. You read through it and you're like, gosh, I really want Obi to succeed. I really want Obi to do well. I really want Obi to, you know, do well in the pool. Gosh, I, I hate it when those people are so mean to Obi. Obi really, you know, go. I hope, I hope he goes in for that, you know, that kiss with the girl, right? You root for Obi. And as you do that, I hope you also understand that you should be rooting for all trans kids, right? That as you don't want Obi to experience the transphobia that he experiences, you realize, wait, nobody should experience that, regardless of whether or not they're trans, but especially not other trans kids. And I hope you read it and recognize that this really does happen. This is a very realistic story that could absolutely happen um, to a trans kid right now where they experience those things and they shouldn't. Yeah, I, I love that. that no, that it makes a lot of sense. That kind of rooting, rooting for Obi. I mean, I don't, I don't think you wrote the book to be a thriller, but I was definitely on the edge of my seat. Like, what's going to happen to? Oh, I cared so much about him. So I, I think you absolutely accomplished that. Thank um, you. So the the book really weaves together two extremely important issues to transgender people from a political perspective today kind of unfortunately so, which is discussions around trans kids and around trans athletes. And yep. these have kind of both become really hot, hot button issues. And yep. um, I, maybe I want to start more on the uh, athletic side, if, if we can start there. Why was sure. it important to you to write a book specifically about a student athlete? And could you explain to the audience, for those who may not be as familiar with, what what's going on today with trans athletes in the United States? Sure. Okay. So why was it important to, to write about a student athlete? Um, there, there's a very simple reason to me. It's because that was that's my story. And that's one that I did not see anywhere. Um, and I continue not to see places. There are still many times when I'm doing the advocacy work that I do where people have not talked about trans athletes at all, especially not student athletes, right? Kids, uh, kid athletes. Um, so that was the first reason is I really wanted and I saw no other way to write a novel, especially not my first novel that didn't include something about being a trans athlete um, or wasn't centered on being a trans athlete. Um, I know that I needed those stories when I was a kid. And I know the more that I speak about this, the more I know and I, I really feel in my core that other people need these stories, too. Um, you don't actually have to grow up and be an athlete in college or a professional athlete or even good at your athleticism in order to have athletics be important to you. Which which brings me to the next thing, which is it is very important to let trans kids play sports. It is very important to let anybody play sports because they are a very important developmental part of life, right? They teach you so many things you don't learn in school. Um, the ability to push through difficult times, the ability to fall down and get back up. Not a lot of people learn how to fail. Sports teach you. You have to fail in sports in order to, to get better at them. Um, they teach you teamwork, camaraderie. They teach you tenacity. They teach you routine. So there's lots of things you learn in sports that are just important developmental skills um, that we then rob trans kids of when we exclude them from sports. So that, that brings me to what you asked the second part of your question, which is what's happening in the country right now. So over the past year, we've seen a record-breaking number of anti-transgender legislation focused on two parts. Um, forbidding trans kids from receiving uh, gender affirming and life-saving health care, um, and forbidding trans kids from competing in sports, mostly focused on trans girls competing in girls' sports, but usually just forbidding trans kids in general from competing in sports that align with their gender identity. Um, there have been over 100 anti-transgender legislative bills in the past year. Um, there aren't even 100 states, so I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how that's possible. Um, 68 or 70 uh, the numbers, I, I don't know exactly, but over 68 num um, of them are anti-transgender sports bills. Again, there aren't even 68 states, so that means, and, and it's only happening in 30 or so states, so most states have more than one anti-transgender legislative bill, which is just ridiculous. Um, again, all of these bills are targeting children. They're not about adults. They're not about any kind of adult things. It's children only. And this is really important when we turn to the sports part specifically, because people will say, but you know, the Olympics, blah, 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 blah. And the, you know, professional level sports, blah, 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 blah. Whenever they talk about trans people, they hear transgender and they hear sports, immediately they're talking about the Olympics. 
this has nothing to do with the Olympics. This has nothing to do with the NCAA or college sports. This has nothing to do with private level sports. It actually has nothing to do with professional sports. It has everything to do with children. These are 10 year old kids who want to play soccer with their friends. This is, you know, eight year old Sally who wants to play volleyball with the other girls. This is children. And I think it's so important to recognize that because not only do they not have biological differences before the age of puberty, right? Except for the presence and absence of the penis, nobody plays sports with a penis, right? Um, and if they are, that's a different issue that you're having. Um, there should be no really reason that you are policing children's bodies. They can play whichever team they'd like to play. If they get to an elite level where the competitive, you know, values matter at all, then they actually have regulated rules already that are based on hormones at all elite levels that include transgender sports. They have a policy for regulating hormones, but you don't need to do that for children that are just playing around. So why is OB especially important right now? Um, because he's a trans athlete who's just playing school sports. Um, and he happens to be okay at them, but he's okay at a regional level. And he's just hanging out, being good at, good at what he does and loving swimming. And swimming being a thing that is really, really important to him. He also is a trans kid who is receiving gender affirming health care and it is life saving to him in many different ways. Um, and in some states, that would be literally a criminal offense for a doctor to provide to him, uh, which is bonkers. So um, I didn't intend for it to be that relevant this year uh, because I wrote the book before these bills began to be passed, but um, it happens to be particularly and sadly relevant in that way. Um, so hopefully it can help people learn more in that in that sense. Absolutely. Thanks for kind of a little bit of the really breaking down of that issue. And I think it something that really strikes me is that everyone should be concerned about the kind of invasion of children's privacy, totally. bodies, bodily autonomy, like right to participate and just be kids, like cis and trans kids like Absolutely. because this is this is just going to affect all children and their ability to just just be kids and explore and experiment and, and figure out who they are. Well, and I, Eli, if, you, if I may, I want to add a little bit more to that. People people forget that these bills don't just affect trans kids. You're absolutely right. They affect everybody. Um, and especially when we talk about girls sports, people are like, oh, you know, the inclusion of trans uh, trans girls is going to destroy women's sport or destroy girls sport. The reality is that in order to exclude trans people, you have to know which ones are trans. And in order to do that, you actually have to test them. You can't just be like, oh, you're trans and kick you out. You have to test them. And what do these tests include? A lot of times they include genital inspections, right? So we're looking at the genitals of children to allow them to compete in a sport or not. Again, nobody plays sports with their penis. So it's really unnecessary and not, you know, not to mention pedophilic in many ways. Um, any girl then can be tested, right? Any girl can be accused of being transgender. And when this happens, at what point is a girl too good to be accused of being transgender? At what point is a girl too tall or too fast or too strong or her hair too short or her body or her presentation too masculine to then be accused of being transgender? And what happens here is that we're not only demonizing transness, but we're also legally enforcing the policing of what a girl's body can look like in order to compete in sport. That legal policing, right, of girls' bodies, that's what's going to destroy women's sport, not the inclusion of trans women. Trans women are not a threat to women's sport. Thank you so much. Yeah, a little sure. bit, a little bit louder uh, for, yeah. for everyone. Um, I, one, I, I wasn't actually intending to take this conversation in this direction, but something that strikes me is this is also, and I, I don't know if you're um, up for talking about this a little bit, but there's also often an intersection with racism in the yes. way that we're policing bodies in sports. Can yes. you maybe talk a little bit about how that's playing out as well? Sure. Yeah, so when we talk about the the, the legally enforcing um, uh, of policing of women's bodies, uh, we have to think about who it's going to affect. And the reality is it's going to disproportionately affect black and brown women, black and brown bodies, because historically they have already been policed more than any other body. Um, and white supremacy often puts black women in a category of not feminine enough. And when we see that, when we see black women as, quote, more masculine, they are going to be attacked more as being accused of being transgender. This is already happening. 
by the way. You don't, we don't need these rules to be in place in order for this to happen. We already are seeing black women be attacked more and more so, um, and actually being accused of being transgender already. Um, that actually happened with a couple of recent Olympic athletes and some ho Olympic hopefuls. Um, but this isn't new, right? This, this policing of black and brown women's bodies, but specifically black women's bodies in sports, uh, in sports specifically is not new. We've seen it with Serena Williams, with Simone Biles, with Castro Semenya, with the two black women who were um, from Nairobi, who the runners who were kicked out of the Olympics this past year. This is not new at all. Um, it's just a new permutation of how <laughs> Uh, to enforce white supremacy, colonialism, and the patriarchy. Um, so I think it's a really important part that people often miss. Um, and and it's it's all about this system that's really, you know, parented by patriarchy and white supremacy that come together to police black and brown women's bodies and anybody who disrupts those systems of the patriarchy and white supremacy, so trans people included. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so much for the, sure. the for further information. You just... Um, you have so much uh, up-to-date knowledge on, on what's going on. And I think it's really important that, that people stay educated and understand that these are not just trans issues um, sure. and that they should care about trans people, um, but, but also that ho hopefully they should care about the larger systems that trans people are being oppressed by. Yeah, we, we all need to be alarmed for trans people, but we also need to be alarmed for society in general because we're going down a very dangerous, slippery slope of um, of, of policing people's bodies to a point where people are not going to be able to just be themselves. And all people, not just trans people. Yeah, I, I agree completely. We have a question come in um, from the audience that that uh, is, is really um, kind of in line with this conversation. The question says, thank you so much, Skylar, for being here. Um, Similar to Eli, you also helped me a lot during my transition. Um, and uh, Adrian asks, why, why do you think there's such a difference in how trans girls versus trans boys are treated within sports? Yeah, this is a great question. So th there's a really simple answer and then I'll get into some complexities. The simple answer is misogyny, right? Um, so misogynistic, uh, bigotry, right? the, the hatred of, of women and femmes, um, or the discrimination against women and femmes, is is very clearly part of this conversation where trans girls specifically um, are, are more often marginalized um, by conversations around this. Um, that's the overarching statement. The next statement um, is the, is, a, is a couple of reasons. The reason that the media will tell you, right, the reason that you'll get from a lot of people who are against trans girls competing in sports, but not against me, right, a trans man competing in sports, the reason that they, they will um, uh, say is because of, quote, biological advantages. And this comes from the argument, uh, actually, this comes from a lot of things. The first thing is sexism. And the sexism argument says that anybody assigned male at birth, so natal, quote, natal boys, right, are automatically better at sports than anybody assigned female at birth or, quote, natal girls. Um, that is a sexist belief that a lot of people don't even know that they hold. But they think that anybody who's assigned male birth is automatically better than somebody assigned female birth. That is false. In fact, and I'll give you swimming data because I'm a swimmer, um, and I know you are too, Eli. In fact, before the age of around nine or 10, all the girl cut times, right? So qualifying times for fast swim meets for, for girls are actually faster than the ones for boys. Why? Because girls are socialized to be submissive and listen to rules, which means they usually do better actually in sports before puberty hits. Um, so this sexist belief, right? That girls are worse at sports than boys um, is what I just said, sexist. That's the first thing it comes out of. The next thing is that testosterone is a real thing, right? So testosterone is a hormone that is often released usually during natal puberty for a boy um, or for somebody assigned to male at birth. And that testosterone has a lot of impacts on our physiology that have impacts on sport. Um, the reality is that testosterone to take its full effects can take years. So even if you go through puberty around 13 or 14, you probably aren't getting all the effects until 20 or so. Um, however, Again, if we're talking about children's sports, it doesn't matter a whole lot because most people are just playing to have fun. If they get good, and they're going to go to an elite level, they actually have hormone regulations. And when trans girls, right, assigned male at birth girls are competing at elite levels and they have gone through testosterone driven puberty, they have to actually take testosterone suppressants. They cannot just waltz on to a women's team if they have testosterone in their bodies at, a, you know, average male levels, they have to take hormone suppressants, which brings that down. So people have all these biological advantage and arguments that actually are not relevant when we look at elite level sports where there are rules and regulations that are in place to control that. Um, 
people get all nervous. Oh, well, you know, they're taller, they're stronger, they're this, they're that, because, you know, even if they understand the testosterone suppression, um, which I'll offer that lots of people are tall and bad at sports. I have met lots of tall people who are bad at sports. I've also met lots of short people who are great at sports. Um, and I've also met lots of people whose bodies are just different for lots of different reasons. And we don't usually exclude somebody just because they're tall, right? They're tall and okay. But there's lots of cis women who are also tall. So I want to remind you that biological diversity and biological advantages absolutely exist within sports. But when a trans woman has a quote biological advantage because of her height or when a black woman has some sort of biological advantage because of how her body is made up, it's immediately considered unfair. The reality is that it's racist, that it's bigoted, that it's sexist, that's misogynist, and has nothing to do with true fairness. Um, sports are already unfair in lots of different ways. And biological advantages are actually not part of the unfairness. Unfairness is barriers to access, the fact that women athletes are paid for less than men athletes. Um, they are barriers to access for uh, people dependent on socioeconomic status. There's a lot of actually things that are unfair about sports, but trans athletes competing is not one of them. Thank you so much. Yeah, I... I... Eventually, it just comes down to transphobia. You you run out of arguments, yep. and eventually, it's just it's just exclusionary. Yeah. Um, but thanks for thanks for breaking it down because you know th this comes sure. up and suddenly everyone is an armchair endocrinologist or something. So yeah. Well, that's a, you know that's a really important point to point out. Something I also like to remind people is nobody cares about women's sports actually a lot of the time until a trans woman wants to play. And if you're a women's sports fan out there, thank you. That's great. But most people don't care about women's sports until a trans woman wants to play. And suddenly they are like a massive women's sports fairness fan. They don't care about fairness. They care about policing women's bodies. Absolutely. Um, okay, we're getting some more questions from the audience, which is great. This sure. one is is very sweet. Um, someone asks, has anyone bought movie rights to OB yet? <laughs> um, not that I know of, but I would love for it to be a movie. So if anyone here has connections, um, I think it would be an excellent movie. Um, and so if you have anybody who's connected, please reach out to me. Uh, I will share my, my contact info later. I would love that very much. Um, I, th I think the world needs, needs a movie about a transgender kid who is just a, just a kid in many ways. Um, okay, next, the next question we have is, is more going back to, to your own experiences. Um, sure. the, the question is, uh, Skylar, I'm curious about the response you experienced from your peers on your team in university and also your peers elsewhere at university. Was it as you expected it to be? So in general, I was very fortunate to have positive responses from people around me. Um, in terms of my swim team specifically, Kevin, the men's coach, actually sat down with the whole team before he offered me the spot on the men's team. And he said, hey, team, do we want to do this? Do we want to bring a transgender athlete onto this team? What do you think? Um, and everybody actually said yes. And he said, if anybody has any issues, please come talk to me, you know, in my office because he wanted to give people, you know, uh, I don't know, private opportunity to say they disagreed. And nobody did. Nobody came to talk to him in his office. Uh, I know my team. They're vocal. They would have said something <laughs> if they had had a bigger disagreement. Um, that attitude was fairly consistent once I joined the team. That does not mean that everything was easy. That does not mean everybody understood what it meant to be transgender. That does not mean I didn't have run-ins and bumps and, you know, little moments of transphobia. I absolutely did experience um, quite a bit of bumps. But it meant that everybody was welcoming to this extent that says, hey, we are happy to have you here. We have no idea what it means to have a trans athlete on our team, but we'll stumble through it together. Um, and I think that's absolutely what we did. Um, there were a couple people in the league who really struggled with my presence on the team. Um, and I think a couple of people who really didn't know how to digest that, um, that that I threatened, honestly, their masculinity. I think that's what it came down to. I'm supposing I never had conversations with them in the end. Um, but there was one kid in the in the league who really struggled. Um, and my my quiet way of responding was was not to respond, actually. I, I did not engage with this person. We swam the same events, and I kind of just was always nice. And, and, and um, what's the right way to put it? I was cordial. <laughs> um, and the first year he beat me in, in, in all of our events, 100 and 200 breaststroke. Um, and the next year uh, I beat him in, in our events. And the next year I, I beat him in our events. And last year I beat him in our events. Um, and this was my very quiet but loud way of saying I belong here.
even if you don't believe that I do, I belong here. Uh, and I think it would have been a win for me regardless of whether or not I had beat him in, in the pool because when he was upset about my presence there, I did not engage. Um, and instead I focused on why I was there. And I wasn't there to prove to him anything, actually. I wasn't there to prove to him that I was man enough or fast enough or this enough. I, I was there to swim. That's why I was on that team. Um, and so I, I put my head down and I swam. And that to me was the win. Winning it in the pool was also, I'm not going to lie, a very, very sweet uh, addition to that um, and a very easy way to say I belong here and you can't tell me that I that I can't because one of his arguments was something about me not deserving the spot on, on you know, on the team um, and beating him proved that I, you know, he can't say anything. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would say I would say mostly support, right? But um, but some really difficult moments with some people, and I I I really tried to situate myself um, in reminding myself why I was there, which was to swim. Um, and I had many people actually come up to me my last year in college who had been on the team all four years with me and said, "Listen, Skyler, you really you really changed my mind." You really helped me learn, and thank you. Um, and those conversations, I've only had like three or four of those with teammates on my team, only from my my class. And I had other conversations with people from not in my my year. Um, really, really life changing conversations to to hear, and just so impactful to me to know that just simply existing as myself um, was impactful to them. That's that's great to hear, and I think something that that echoes in that story, and also in the book, is that. Well, there's certainly transphobic people and kind of just jerks everywhere. Um, what can make a huge difference is having people in your corner who say, like, I welcome you. I will be here for you. And uh, hopefully that's something that the, the allies watching our conversation today can, can also glean from this, that it can make a big difference to be that person for someone. Absolutely. Having people support you when you have people who don't is life changing. And we will always have people who don't support us. And that's why we always need people who do support us. Um, my coach told me when I was struggling actually in college with a bit of the transphobia I was experiencing, he said, Skylar, uh, I'm gonna use a, a slightly bad word now, um, so warning. <laughs> uh, he said, Skylar, there were always going to be assholes. They will always be assholes. And the, the question is, what do you do about them? Not whether or not they're gonna be there. Um, and I, I, I really took that to heart and I thought to myself, like, I can't change all of them. And he said, he said to me, and I, I really want to share this. I think it's super important. He said, Skylar, you can spend all the energy you have trying to change that one asshole, yeah. or you can use a fraction of that energy to change somebody who's actually going to change. You get to choose. Um, and I've thought about that a lot. Where do I put my energy? How much energy do I put somewhere? And you know what? Sometimes I make the mistake and I spend all my energy units on the asshole because <laughs> I'm like, you can change, right? But the hope um, is that we don't do that often, right? That we give our energy to people who actually deserve it and who actually are going to shift because there's a lot of people out there who are ready and willing to be allies. They just need to be given a chance. They just need to be given some language, some tools. Um, and that's what I've centered my work around is how can I make the people who are listening what can I give them, right? Because people who aren't listening, hopefully my allies will get to them, right? And actually that's my ask for you all here. If you're here and listening, theoretically, um, you care somewhat. That's why you're here. And I'm so glad that you're here. I'm so glad you're listening. But your job is once you leave here is to be an ally to the people who are not here because they're truly the people we need to reach. Um, so take what you've learned here and go and run around and be an ally to other people too. That's the, that's the perfect lead into to the next question we had, which is what does really great allyship look like both in sports and also on a wider basis? Yeah. So I wish I could give you like a really packaged, nice answer, but allyship is a very broad and complex experience, I would say. Um, I do have a link that I want to share with you. It's pinkmantaray, my website, dot com slash allyship. Um, and maybe somebody can throw that in the chat or something, but that's a place where you, there's a step-by-step -step actually one through, I think there's eight things to do to be an ally. Um, but in short, I think allies listen, right? They listen to our experiences. They help, um, what's the right word? Uplift our voices as trans people, right? They don't, we don't necessarily need allies to speak for us. We need to have that privilege of the mic passed to us, right? Um, we need people to use our right name and right pronouns. Very simple way to be an ally. Use our right name, use our right pronouns always. Not just when we're in the room, not just in our present tense, but always. Talk about us respectfully always. And step two, level ally, um, is to correct other people when they misgender us, right? Correct other people when they use the incorrect name and pronouns. Um, 
advocating for us on a on a you know political scale is also really important voting for people who are going to protect our rights as opposed to directly take away from them so right now again there's lots of people um in the u.s trying to take away directly trying to take away the rights from trans people call your state senators call um your your reps uh in your state um go lobby at the the courthouse and say hey these sh bills should not be passed um Call your U.S. senator and have them pass the Equality Act. That's a really big one, a sweeping one that hopefully will help protect gender identity. It's, it adds gender identity um, to the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Um, so the Equality Act is really important. You can literally call your U.S. senator today and be like, hey, please pass the Equality Act. So there are lots of things you can do, and I'd encourage you to check out pinkmandroy.com slash allyship. Um, but sort of the main things respect us, right? And just our name and pronouns very simply, advocate for us um, and listen to us, right? Use your privilege to uplift our voices. Absolutely, and we did have the um, link up there for those who, who missed it. Um, I, I wanna move on to one question that's actually, I, I think this is such an important question. It's something we haven't touched on yet at all, which is how do you understand non-binary identities within the context of binary sports systems? How can non-binary people best participate in these systems and also advocate for gender inclusivity? Yeah. Okay. So this is probably the most difficult question that I get these days when we talk about uh, athletics and trans people. Um, and I think it's a great question and I'm so glad that, that it's been asked. Um, I will preface this by saying, like I said, it's a hard question and I don't have the best answer. I don't, I don't know what the best answer is. So these are my thoughts um, and I'm sure they will continue to evolve. Um, Right now, sports are, are segregated based on, on actually maybe it's on sex most of the time. They should be, we're trying to have it be segregated based on gender, right? The difference being sex is what you're assigned at birth and according to your anatomy, gender being who you identify as um, and in your internal sense of your own gender. Um, the goal right now in many ways is to shift it to be segregated based on gender. So you self-select um, which team feels best to you based on your gender problem is there is no gender team for non-binary people, right? Um, and so what I actually think is ideal is if we de-gender sports altogether, and we don't have this called the, you know, women's team and the men's team, because it's actually not what's important when we go, you know, to the soccer field. It doesn't really matter what gender identity everybody holds. Sports are not actually about gender identity. They're about camaraderie and being on a team, and they are about athletic performance in many ways. When we talk about elite level sports, especially athletic performance, and that doesn't actually depend on your gender identity either. It depends on what you have in your body, right? And so I actually think it'd be really cool if sports were just called high testosterone group and low testosterone group. Not sexy names, but um, I think it makes a whole lot more sense. If you think about other sports like, I don't know, wrestling, for example, it's all about weight class. So I wonder if there's a, a world to come that's segregating sports based on ability, actually, um, and testosterone being sort of the, the easiest equalizer of ability. Um, and that would allow me to compete with other people with high testosterone because I take testosterone. Um, it would allow non-binary people to just be segregated based on what their bodies are like. Um, and then hopefully not have, see it as a gendered idea, right? Um, I don't think we're anywhere close to this, to be quite honest with you. I don't think we're anywhere close to it. I also don't know if it's actually the perfect solution and I haven't thought through all the different implications and I'm sure there's many implications I couldn't even think through. Um, so that's currently where I'm at and what I tell non-binary people, because I, I, I mentor a lot of folks and have some non-binary athletes and what I, what I share with non-binary folks is that you choose the team right now that feels best to you. And once you choose what that team is, remind yourself that they are going to gender that team, but you do not have to. And just because other people gender that team does not mean that you are or the wrong gender or you don't belong or whatever. It just means that that's the label that they're putting on the team. Um, and I think it's really important for us as trans people and non-binary people to step on into spaces that are gendered and um, say, we don't gender these spaces, right? And I did this a little bit, not exactly with non-binary identity, but when I was competing in a women's swimsuit, a women's swimsuit, I had to remind myself, this is just a suit. It is just a bunch of like lycra and nylon and cotton that says women to other people, but I don't have to say that it's women to me. It's just a uniform. And I think when we can de-gender what other people gender, it actually allows us more freedom to choose what feels best for us as opposed to having to participate in this binary system. Um, so that's my best advice coupled with my attempt at a best answer. Um, I think it's really complex and I 
I wish I had a better answer. Uh, and I honestly wish that everybody could just play sports altogether, but I don't think it's that simple. And I think that's why, you know, um, the, the kindest, least transphobic scholars in this space are, are really struggling with, with some of these rules because there, there is complexity when we talk about, uh, biological sex specifically, um, because it's not that simple. It's not binary. It's not, um, uh, it's not nearly as simple as we're taught in grade school. Yeah, it's such a it's such a difficult topic, but I think it's important for us to all like let's it hopefully we all at least spent the last few minutes wondering like what would that look like to kind yeah. of get rid of those boxes? Can we like move more towards that world than the world that we're in today? Right. Yeah. Um okay, the next the next question we have is is back about the book. Um which is when did you start writing OB? When was was this something you had in your mind for a long time and do you have any more future plans for books? Yeah. Um, so I started writing OB. I'm the kind of person, I just want to preface this because people sometimes think this is ridiculous, but um, I am the kind of person that needs to sit down to a task and do the whole task. I'm really not like, I, I don't piece things apart. I'm not like, I'm going to write like a little bit here and a little bit there. And like, eventually it'll get done. I, I can't do that. I work on deadlines and I work on, on things being like very clearly set out. <clears throat> so, excuse me. I got the idea to write OB in the fall of 2019, right after I graduated from college. <coughs> Sorry. Um, you get some water? And I, um, no, I'm okay. I just, just had, yeah, I'm okay. Um, so I started writing or thinking about it the fall of 20, winter, I guess, of 2019. Um, had some conversations with uh, an editor that I'd actually um, worked with before because I wrote a short story for a book called Fresh Ink, which is an anthology of short stories about diverse experiences and diverse kids. And I wrote a short story about a transgender swimmer, surprise, <laughs> um, for that story, uh, for, for, for that anthology. And the editor had been pushing me for years to, to write a book, um, to write a novel. And, um, and so in the fall or winter of 2019, I thought, hmm, okay, I think I actually finally have the space to do this. I should I should get on it. Um, and so she said, write me the manuscript and we can talk about, you know, going forwards with it. And um, and I was going to get an agent and all those things. Um, so I, I was like, all right, I'm going to write it in a month. <laughs> um, that was my, my goal. So January came around and I began writing. I think I began writing probably January, actually January 1, uh, I'm pretty sure, January 1, 1 or 2. Um, and I finished the manuscript not in a month, but um, by mid-February, so about five or six weeks. I was a, a little over my own deadline. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, as I don't know if this is interesting to folks, but that's when my sort of like then book writing process began after that, when I then submitted to, to literary agents, when I sent it to um, to editors, uh, and when I began the, the, the process of actually like getting it published. Um, so the, the process took about... The whole process was basically starting December 2019, and now we're here uh, in in the fall of 2021. So about two two years, I get one and a half years to publishing. Um, I do have plans to write more books. My original plan was to was was definitely to write a sequel um, or maybe um, a third book uh, that are about Obi um, or from Obi's world. Uh, I wanted to write them potentially about um, other characters, but we'll see. Uh, and that's all I'm going to share about that now. Um, and I probably have. Well, I definitely have other books coming as well that are nonfiction. I actually think I'm, I'm a far better nonfiction writer, but um, I haven't actually proved that yet since both the things I've written are, are fiction. So we'll see. Cool. Stay thanks tuned. for thanks for sharing that. I would I would honestly love to read more about um, Obi and and his world. Um, and I actually think like uh, the, the the kind of young adult. I I, I think it's um, you did a really great job at writing in a way that was also in, engaging to adults. Uh, Thank you. Definitely Thank felt you. like something a 13 year old could understand, but that um, I, I personally still still really enjoyed. So I, I hope you stick uh, kind of kind of stick with that um, story because I, I would love to read more. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I really wanted to be accessible to kids, but also I wanted adults to read it. And I'm glad that you highlighted that adults can read it and it can be engaging for adults, too. <laughs> yes. Anyone watching who hasn't read yet, please, please go out and, and read. Um, go check it out. I think <laughs> we're also as part of our events this week highlighting um, LGBTQ owned bookstores that are stocking OB. Oh, awesome. So we have a list of those available where people can purchase, um, purchase the book from, um, one, one more question I had for you on the, on the book. Um, and I have to apologize a little bit because I think we could like have an entire talk on this subject. Um, but in, in addition to being trans and a swimmer, as you mentioned, OB is also half Korean, which I know is also a really important part of your identity. And so I, I kind of want to ask you about the, the specific experience being a being a trans person of color and why it was important to to bring that to to, to Obi as a character as well. Sure. 
Um, yeah, so I people ask me, and it's been something I've been thinking about a lot recently, sort of intersectional identities, period. And if you think about um, so my, the highlights of my intersectional identity, so half Korean, mixed race is kind of part of that. Um, swimmer, um, transgender, queer, man. Those are of the main ones, I'm gonna say. Um, I think that Korean was probably the first one I recognized. Mixed race, actually, specifically. It was the first one I was able to, to see in the world, um, even before gender identity or any sort of other parts of myself, because it was so apparent in my household, right? My dad is white. My mom is Korean. They clearly look different. The families they come from clearly look different and operate differently and have different cultural backgrounds, have different languages, right? Um, so I thought, I think that was just so obvious to me from a young age. And people will ask me, well, when did you first, you know, recognize race? When did you first um, know you were, you're a mixed race or Korean? And I was like, I, I really cannot remember a time when I didn't know that. Um, and when I didn't feel also caught between worlds. And I think that's a really important part um, of my identity as a mixed race kid specifically. Um, I didn't see myself in people around me. My mom, my mom fought very hard. She actually is in the literary world and she fought very hard to provide me with stories of people like me, but that meant providing me with Korean stories and Korean American stories, but not mixed race Korean American, right? So it's Koreans living in the US perhaps, or just Korean stories. So I had Korean culture around me in that, in that sense. Um, but it, it felt very alienating to me because I am not a hundred percent Korean. Um, I am mixed and that was, I was always too Asian to be white around the white kids and I was all too white to be Korean around the Korean kids. I was always like impure to other Asian people. And so I never felt like I fit in and that was really difficult for me. Um, and I and I remember thinking always, oh, I, I wish I was at least one or the other, right? Instead of this stuck in between. And it forced me, and, and now I, I don't wish anything was different about my my race. Um, I and my ancestry, I, I love being this, this caught between worlds. Um, and also, by the way, there's a lot more mixed people these days that I can relate to and, and be around. Um, but there's something really special about that, right? There's something really special about also the struggle that it provided me demanding that I figure out how I could define myself instead of other people defining me, right? And that was really helpful when I started coming out as transgender because I was also caught between worlds and I had to really define who I am without other people uh, infiltrating that with their beliefs or their standards or their stereotypes of who I am. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I wanted that to be present in Obi. Um, I, I, I never read books about Korean American mixed race kids, and, and I thought that um, that he should he should hold that identity too to help other kids see pieces of themselves in books as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it will um, provide that representation uh, for someone. And I think there's maybe one way to look at it, which is like, wow. It, half Korean transgender swimmer, like what a small segment, isn't that like one person, you know, but I think there's another way to view it, which is like, hopefully kids who are mixed race can see themselves in this book. Hopefully kids who sure. are Korean, hopefully kids who are transgender, that it's, it's actually more, more additive kind of. Exactly. Well, and also because it's so specific, what you can glean is that if your identities don't overlap actually at all with Obi, but you have specific identities, you can have resonance there. And what I found over my journey of, I've given over 350 talks over the past several years um, as an advocate and as an athlete um, and as a trans person and as a queer person, as a Korean person. And I'm always like, gosh, what do these people you know, have to connect with me about like, they're not athletes or they're, or they're, you know, um, not Korean American or they're not transgender or queer. Let's say I'm talking to like a bank, which I have actually done many times. I'm like, what do they care? about what I have to say, but they always do. And the reason is because I have common humanity and I present my humanity and I say, hey, this is who I am. And people have connections with that because we all actually are far more similar than we give ourselves credit for. Um, and when my identities are so specific, other people who have their own specificities about their identity, maybe it's not race related, maybe it's not gender related, maybe it's just whatever feels specific or alienating to them, unique to them, they can relate with me on that. Um, and it's about relating on the emotions, not the specific identities. Um, yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense to me, and I, I think it, it really comes through um, in the book. And I, I did so. The the links to the bookstores, by the way, are, are in the description of the YouTube video if you're watching. So please go check out the book um, if you if you haven't had it already. Um, maybe a, a related question uh, that that we have from the audience, uh, which is how supportive have your family been through your transition and sports career? Um, this person says, I know that can differ hugely between trans people and that it can affect how things go to an incredible degree. 
Sure. Um, you're absolutely correct. It can affect massively a trans person's life, um, having family that does or doesn't support uh, their identity. Um, in fact, uh, a lot of times, um, well, not a lot of times, statistically speaking, research has shown um, that when parents reject their trans kids' identities, they can increase suicidality by two and a half times, substance abuse by three and a half times, and many other you know, mental health issues simply by rejecting their kids' identity. Um, so it's it's really important to accept trans kids, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of trans kids don't get that. Um, having just one supportive parent can vastly change the suicidality actually of the kid as well. Literally, just one parent who supports, um, and we can translate that to family members as well. It's just so important for families to accept and welcome a trans kid's identity. Um, my parents were very accepting of me in that they they always showed me love, and I'm very grateful and lucky to be able to say that. They never said they were going to kick me out or uh, you know financially cut me off or that they didn't love me or any of those kinds of things. Um, and as even as I say that, I'm like, this is such a low bar. It is because unfortunately those things happen a lot to trans kids. So my parents were above that very low bar um, and have gone above and beyond as as we've walked through my journey together. But I will say at the beginning there was a lot of struggle. Struggles. Um, they didn't really know what it meant to be transgender. They were very confused uh, on how I became transgender, if you will. Of course, I never became transgender. I just learned that I am transgender. Um, they were resistant to me medically transitioning, so getting top surgery, taking testosterone, because they were worried about its permanence. They were worried about whether or not I was correct about what I wanted. Um, and they didn't understand why I needed it. They were like, you're fine as you are. Um, and it was it was um, really difficult actually for me for a while because I had to fight them on that. And I eventually said to them, listen, I don't need you actually to understand everything. Because they were always like, oh, I don't get it. I don't get it. Why do you have to do this? I don't get it. And I'd be like, fine, <laughs> you don't have to get it. I actually am not asking you to understand. I'm asking you to trust me. I'm asking you to trust that I know what's best for myself, that I know myself, and I'm asking you to trust me as I go through this process to figure it out on my own. If I'm wrong, I figure it out, right? I'm asking you to trust me. I'm asking you to walk through this with me. Hold my hand. You don't have to understand why. Just come with me. Um, and to their credit, they did. And they, they did trust me. And I think as they've watched me grow into myself, that trust has blossomed into understanding. And I think that's the case for a lot of people. Sometimes we just have to trust our kids to be who they are because they do actually know who they are and the understanding will come. These days, my parents are my biggest supporters, fiercest cheerleaders, um, probably a little too involved in my work in one way or another because they're so excited about it. Um, and I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, but it didn't come from an initial place of understanding. It came from a really strong bond of love um, and their leap of faith to trust me. Thanks, thanks for sharing that. I know it's always like, these can be difficult topics as, as trans people. Um, sure. But I, I think probably a, a, maybe a good lesson in that is like, you know, I think if someone if someone comes out to you about maybe not even just their, their gender identity, but different aspects, you know, just understanding that they've probably thought about this an enormous amount already yep. and, and placed a great deal of trust in you to, to tell you that. So, yep. Um, Actually, if you want a, a list of things to do when somebody comes out to you completely crowdsourced by a bunch of LGBTQ plus people who follow me, go to pinkmantaray.com slash coming dash out. My website, pinkmantaray.com slash coming dash out. And there's a button that says um, coming out advice for cishet folks. So if you're not queer, actually, if you're queer too, it works for you too. But um, if you're not queer, especially, uh, that link can tell you a list of things to do when somebody comes out, one of the, one of which is do not ask, are you sure? Um, yes, we are sure. And that's why we're telling you. Or no, we're not. And we're still trusting you with the information. And you don't need to ask us if we're sure. Absolutely. I, I um, th Those resources on your website are, are so fantastic, um, just as places to to point to people to. You know, I've seen you on, on Instagram, like, like highlighting them and people kind of asking you the same questions over and over again. So also to trans people, maybe watching this who want to have somewhere to send their friends and families that maybe you don't have to answer all these questions directly, uh, please check out Skylar's website. Yeah, everything's compiled on pinkmanaray.com slash FAQs, right? So FAQs, pinkmanaray.com slash FAQs. That's where you can find all my common questions. Um, and I encourage you, if you didn't have your question answered, also in this chat to check that out because I do get a lot of the same questions. Uh, and so as a result, I've answered a lot of them. Also on that page, you'll find my trans athlete page. And if you were listening earlier to the um, comments about trans athletes and the fairness about trans athletes, I strongly encourage you to check out pinkmanaray.com slash trans athlete because that's where I have literally everything that I've said about trans athletes written down um, in an organized fashion that you can then read and use to, to, to talk to other people about these things. 
Yeah, and especially if you're an ally watching, you know, if you want to be prepared to go into conversations, maybe with people who aren't watching videos like these, who don't understand what the big deal is about trans athletes, I think the great allyship action is probably to go get educated. Um, cool, we have um, one more question, um, which is uh, actually COVID related, which we haven't talked at all about yet. Um, as a hobby athlete who really struggled with the restrictions during the pandemic, did you also have to deal with training restrictions? And if yes, how did you deal with them? Yeah, so I actually graduated right before the pandemic began. So I, I my my eighteen year long competitive swim career came to a close in February twenty nineteen, and March twenty twenty was when the pandemic started. So training wasn't impacted because I wasn't training. Um, I do consider myself an athlete still and still engage with lots of like athletic things, um, and in that way, I think it was definitely affected. I couldn't. Most pools were just completely shut down, and there were not any open swim hours for a long time, at least around where I lived. Um, so I couldn't just go to the pool and swim. And so that definitely um, impacted me. And I think it still impacts me because it's still difficult to find pool hours and lots of places have like specific times that you can go and I, it never matches my schedule. Um, so I've had to find different ways to engage with movement. Um, I bike a lot. That's a, a way that I really like to move. Um, and so that's been helpful to me. But um, if you also had your you know, athletic regimen um, or, or schedule routine impacted by the pandemic, um, I think it has to, it's time to get creative, right? And shift uh, and find other ways to move your body. Um, and then also be really kind to yourself when you can't. Um, instead of beating yourself up about it, instead of getting stressed about it, um, it's about pivoting, right? And being kind because we're all living through this panorama, pandemic, panini, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I think we have to be kind to ourselves as we do. It's stressful, it's difficult, and we don't get to use the same coping mechanisms that we always did. Um, and so it takes creativity, but creativity demands kindness with ourselves too. Absolutely, it's been a, it's been a challenging time. Um, so I think um, appreciate your, your thoughts on it. Um, sure. Skyly, that's, that's all the questions that we have. So I just want to thank you so much for taking the time, the energy, um, to come and talk to us today, to, to answer everyone's questions, to create this resource that will live on in the future that people can hopefully come back to. Um, and, and just generally for, for all of your visibility, your activism, everything you do to, to help make this world a better place for trans people. Um, we're, we're super grateful and I know I'm, I'm super humbled um, by your work. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and one more just little pub I wanted to provide. I'm running a workshop this coming week um, and uh, it's on intersectionality specifically. So if you listen to this and you were wondering about intersectionality, about race, about being transgender, all those things combined, um, visit my website, pinkmanray.com slash support. Um, and there's a workshop button uh, that's for me and Caden, uh, his, um, it's a friend of mine, Caden Coleman, who's a black, gay, transgender man, and we are going to run this workshop together, and it's, it's going to be incredible. I'm so excited for it. Uh, and it's this coming week on Thursday. It's specifically during Trans Awareness Week. Um, so I encourage you to come to that, bring your friends to that, uh, especially if you if you haven't heard a whole lot about intersectionality. You're like, what is intersectionality? Why do I keep hearing this word? Come to the workshop. It's going to be awesome. It's 90 minutes. Um, we're going to talk a lot about uh, our experiences. You'll be invited to engage if you'd like to. Um, so check out that pinkmanaray.com slash support. Um, and I, I hope I see you there. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you again for taking the time. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Um, I'm super excited to be able to talk to you. Eli, your questions were awesome and I really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks. And thank Thanks you so much too. everybody for watching. <laughs> Thanks. Bye everyone. Thank you for coming. Take care.